of Iowa Public Television and by the Iowa Reading Association, committed to developing the reading proficiency of Iowa's young people and pleased to help support the Iowa broadcast of Reading Rainbow. Word is there's a new team in town. They're into solving mysteries. We're talking major detective stuff. And this other team member is simply unbelievable. They're kids, they're smart, they're totally cool, and they always stick together. Oh, yeah. And when they do the word thing, well, you've never seen anything like it. Watch Ghost Rider right here on this station. Get with the program. See it here on Iowa Public Television today at 6. The Iowa race for the Senate nears the finish line with the final strides run in a debate between Gene Lloyd-Jones and Charles Grassley. Iowa Public Television brings you live coverage of the debate sponsored by the Greater Des Moines Chamber of Commerce Federation. Watch the Senate Candidates Debate Monday live at 12.30 and again at 8 the same evening. Then at 10.30, watch the speeches delivered to the chamber audience by alternative party candidates in the Senate race, Alternative Views. This is Iowa Public Television. Good morning, I'm Dean Borg, and welcome to this Sunday's edition of Iowa Press. Well, the curtain's about to come down in the campaign of 1992, only two days remaining now until November 3rd's general election, and the final act is underway. The outcome of the campaign drama, though, hasn't been written yet, and that's the case at the federal, state, and local levels, and also for this year's hot campaign item in Iowa, at least, the Iowa Equal Rights Amendment. Today, we're going to talk politics of the ERA initiative with two nationally known spokeswomen, Eleanor Smeal and Phyllis Schlafly, who will get their final points across in Iowa press before Iowa goes to the polls to thumbs up or thumbs down on the ERA. Smeal, as you know, has long been identified as a pro-ERA organizer, and currently she's the president of the Feminist Majority Foundation. She's also the organization's founder. Smeal is also a past president of the National Organization for Women. Now, Phyllis Schlafly is founder and president of the Eagle Forum, which for a number of years has battled ERA initiatives on the national and local levels. Schlafly is an attorney and an author and a longtime Republican Party activist. We're sure that we're in for an intense discussion in this Sunday's edition of Iowa Press as Iowa's the only state with the ERA initiative on the 92 ballot, and those results are going to be closely watched across the nation. Iowa once before rejected the ERA, you know, that was in 1980, and today the ERA supporters are hoping that Iowa becomes the 17th state to adopt the amendment. Joining us today at the Iowa Press table will be Dave Yepsen of the Des Moines Register, Mike Glover of the Associated Press, and also Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa. We hope that you'll be with us, too. Right now, though, we're on our way to Washington, D.C. for another lively session with the McLaughlin Group, complete with pre-election predictions there. And then at the top of the hour, we hope that you'll join us for Iowa Press with Eleanor Smeal and Phyllis Schlafly. We'll see you then. SCI Financial Group Incorporated, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. From the nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE. From residential to commercial lighting, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue one, down to the wire. So as we drive down the wire, the train rolling, I look you in the eye and I say, I ask for your support and I ask for your vote based on character and trust and let's lead the world to new heights of prosperity for every single America. Don't let them tear it down. God bless America. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my mama used to say to me, that old adage, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, 
Shame on me. We're not falling for it this time. We can do better. But if you want to do it, we will do it. And every step of the way, just remember, I'm Ross and you're the boss. Thank you very much. Thank George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Ross Perot are hurtling towards the finish line. Bush and Clinton are in a polling dead heat, tied, allowing for the margin of error. Ross Perot's numbers have dropped, and on Tuesday, Mr. Bush was buoyed by positive economic news. The nation's gross domestic product, GDP, grew 2.7% in the third quarter, marking six straight quarters of economic growth. Question, why has this race tightened so dramatically? Freddie the Beetlebomb. John, do you think we spent a little too much time last week talking about the Clinton mandate? Definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely. And I, more tongue <laughs> saying, it's over, John, it's over. John. More the male Madonna. <laughs> John, next week, next Tuesday, it will be over. <laughs> yeah, well, one way or another, the fact is Bush has gained a lot. Uh, Bush deserves a lot of the credit. After that terrible debate in Richmond, he got off the floor, uh, decided to be tough and talk about trust and taxes. He's, he's campaigned well. Perot helped him because Perot coming in shook up the race and set off this two-stage process where votes went from Clinton to Perot and now they're going from Perot to Bush. And frankly, Clinton has helped in the last few days because rather than the uh, appealing and seductive and charming candidate he's been most of the year, he's become sort of shrill and um, merely responding to Bush in a very unattractive way. Very well stated, Fred. <laughs> Eleanor. Talk about shrill. I mean, George Bush is out there flailing around completely without content or syntax. And for a sitting president to call his opponents bozos, I think, really goes over the line. Oh, he says, <laughs> Millie, he says oh, Millie knows more about foreign policy. I think Millie's been running the economy here for a while. <laughs> Great too. line. Listen, Great there's, line. Some, there's some last minute anxiety about dumping the devil you know. You got to get beyond the, the the nationwide popularity numbers and look at the states that matter. Bill Clinton is probably going to win eight of the top ten battleground states. George Bush has no margin of error. He's got to win New Jersey, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. He loses one of those, and he's finished. Several of those states are practically tied right now. I hear different, John. Jack Jamal. I think there's less here than meets the eye. Uh, they. Um, <clears throat> We always knew you were going to have tightening at the end because when you have a challenge of running against an incumbent, people understand they're taking something of a risk and they're going to be careful about it, particularly a, a challenger with as much baggage as Bill Clinton has. But if you look at the states, I can't find a way you get George Bush to 270. Not when he gives away right off the bat. Well, you can't get Clinton there either. I can get Clinton oh, there very easily. No, you can't. You can get it to 243, yeah. but he's, that's no, no, where he stopped. No, no. Oh, you no. can't. You, you can get him 303 pretty easily. I'd like to see it done. Well, you want me to pull out the, pull out the sheet and go Well, we can get it maybe, maybe the, in the next half we can. Uh, go ahead. Did you finish? No, the, 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 point, I'm the point I'm trying to make is that, is that there, it is not just a question of margin of error. He has to win all the states. Elma mentions he also has to get back. Be sure he nails down North Carolina, which is probably all right. But Georgia, which is probably not all right, and a bunch of other small states that are in play. Okay, Mark, throw gorilla dust in the air. <laughs> I think, uh, actually, that George Bush peaked too soon. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. he, uh, he, he made this, this fantastic comeback, and uh, suddenly everybody's going to realize, along about today, that uh, uh, he might win, that he might actually be re-elected re as president of the United States, and then we'll have gridlock with Congress, and we'll have no economic policy uh, to speak of over the next four years, and people are going to recoil from that. Don't forget that in, in, this, in this, retrench, uh, this, re this comeback of Bush's, he's never gotten over 40% of the vote. He, does not, he has an approval rating of yeah. around 40%. Yeah, he, has. he can't get yeah, he it. Has. No, he has. No, CNN he has. poll, 40%. Above 40%. 40 over 40%. Well, that's, a, that's his me, lid. No. He's got believe a lid. Clinton has been yeah. way over 40% many times, and my guess is but, that in the end game, the vote flops back but to But the trending now is pro-Bush in the polls. He's one point separated in the CNN USA Today Gallup poll. Right, which yeah, makes this even weekend, Bush, but I want to talk, let's talk about the significance yeah. of turnout and the time that remains. If it's a, <coughs> does it look like there's, there's going to be a big turnout? I, I read or heard that there's a 1% one, 1 increase in registration, and all this talk about a big turnout is inflated. Yeah. You want to speak to that? 
There's the MTV vote out there, which Bill Clinton appeals to. They need to come out and vote if they want to elect a Democrat. You've got a lot of women who are energized as well. I think the vote totals are going to be out. And you know, whoever comes out that wasn't out four years ago is not is voting for change. They're not voting to keep a status quo president. You know that the place. CNN uh, Gallup poll to which I referred uh, is a is a is a poll of likely voters. Mm -hmm. Now that poll are. has pretty much wiped off the screen the youth vote. Do you think that's unjustified? I do. Uh, based on some numbers and anecdotal experience, uh, people in there, college are excited about this ticket. It has some Bobby Sox appeal. There, there are the, um, the registration figures are not up very much net because all the big states have done purges, but in fact there's been a pretty substantial registration this fall. As an indicator of interest, it's been pretty high in most of the big states. It, the, 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 the key, there are a couple of key blocks here. Black, the black turnout, if the black turnout is at Mondale level rather than Dukakis level, that makes a difference in key states like Michigan, for example, That's, and also in Georgia. And, this, and the second, another group are working women, heads of households, who are most affected by economic issues and do not vote heavily and, and have been indicating... Bill, is, it the, is it the most significant shift, the shift in the Perot vote? He's Absolutely. dropped from 22 right, to 14, right, he'll right. probably go down possibly to 10, maybe right. below 10. Exactly. All right, where's that going to go? The assumption is that these people want change, but right. they're also right of center. Many people used to describe them, as a matter of fact, as Buchananites. They want in change. Now, John, do you think that they, 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 they have change. enough psychological comfort from the 2.7% increase in the, in the GDP to warrant them saying, okay, I hate Bush because, because he hasn't done enough for the economy, but I'm going to hold my nose, I'm going to vote for him, they're going to go home to Bush. Well, some of them clearly are going to do that, you know, but... but Fundamentally, what Perot has been saying. Well, that's is about, bulk. That's no, wait a minute. But for the whole, the whole of the Bush presidency, 70% of the American people have thought that the country's on the wrong track. Now, under those circumstances, you don't go back to Bush. But here's what happened in the campaign, and I think even Eleanor will agree with this because we've talked about it. About two or three weeks ago, the press suddenly anointed Clinton as a sure winner, and it changed the whole campaign completely because people started thinking about a, a Clinton right. presidency, and they have doubts about that well, presidency. Yeah, but do. now, sure they Fred, they're talking, they're thinking that we may get a Bush presidency again for four years, and the doubts are going to reverse themselves. I don't really think so. What about Bush? Another thing you know, that is driving a turnout is the the districts that have been gerrymandered to create more minority districts and the minority vote I think will be up and that's Bill Clinton's what as well. A, what about the, the, the appeals made by George Bush that the 22% interest rates of Jimmy Carter and the 15% inflation right. rate of Jimmy Carter is going to be exactly what we're going to see I in think, a Bush administration. I think that it's important. I think it's important that Clinton says this weekend something about the I think it's important that Clinton says this weekend some, something about how a vote for Bush means gridlock and a vote for him means that, that, that Congress will cooperate with him, but that he will be able to discipline Congress cooperate. so that he will not be a rubber stamp. Cooperate and huge spending. That's what you mean. Stamp. And cooperate no. giving away the store. The, the you're, you're a partisan, had, John. The Clinton campaign has had from the beginning the slogan, it's the economy stupid. They're going to close out with a strong economic message. And all, jo all George Bush is doing is try to scare the country. No. That's not going to work, even though it's Halloween. Quickly. Well, Clinton made one huge mistake. It was the same mistake uh, Neil Kinnock made on the economy, and that was to come out for a large tax increase, making him vulnerable on that, on that okay. $150 okay. billion dollar tax increase. Okay. The advertising wall, Bush and Clinton are blitzing the nation's TV screens, making their final appeal to the American people. In his 12 years as governor, Bill Clinton has doubled his state's debt, doubled government spending, and signed the largest tax increase in his state's history. Yet his state remains the 45th worst in which to work, the 45th worst for children. It has the worst environmental policy, and the FBI says Arkansas had America's biggest increase in the rate of serious crime. And now Bill Clinton wants to do for America what he's done for Arkansas. America can't take that risk. CBS, CNN, and newspapers across the country call George Bush's ads misleading and wrong. The fact is, under Bill Clinton's leadership, Arkansas leads the nation in job growth, has the second lowest tax burden and the lowest government spending in the country, and he's balanced 12 budgets. They reduced infant mortality and now have the highest graduation rate in the region, and in the past year, Arkansas's crime rate went down. No wonder the Washington Post says George Bush is lying about Bill Clinton's record and why the Oregonian concluded, frankly, we no longer trust George Bush. Ross Perot is also blitzing the airways with infomercials and standard length ads. Here's a 30 second Perot extract. The president mentioned that you need the right person in a crisis. Well, folks, we've got one, and that crisis is a financial crisis. Pretty simply, who's the best qualified person up here on the stage to create jobs? 
Make your decision and vote on November the 3rd. The American people, I'm doing this because I love you. That's it. Don't waste your vote on politics as usual. Vote for Ross Perot. How effective are these ads, uh, Eleanor, and whose ads are the better? The Clinton ads will not win any awards for creativity, but they're straightforward and they're focused, and they use relatively neutral third parties to make their case. That Bush ad goes over the line. It's like the morning after a nuclear attack. It's wretched excess, and what it does is it takes figures out of context to portray Clinton as a failed governor when, in fact, his record is progressive, and George Bush had him write the guidelines for education in this country back in the days when George Bush was still the education uh, All president. that ad does is show the bad side of Clinton's record. The same way when Bill Clinton and, and Al Gore go around and, and say that uh, Bush has had the worst economic uh, performance uh, uh, since the, the Great uh, Depression, by one standard, that's true. By many other standards, it's not true. That ad was perfectly fair and very effective. Do you think that Clinton's ad was a, was, a, was a brilliant defense ad? I think it's all right. I, 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 I like the aesthetics. I think probably Rogers did another ad. It was very clever. I think Rogers is very You're good. You're going to get any votes? But, but, no, I, 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 the point I, I would make is that we are past the point where the advertising is going to decide this thing. It is being fought out on the news. Every night, it is far, people are being overwhelmed with information about these guys and what they're I, saying. I, I, I don't think I, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. There, it's things that get thrown into somebody's head when they're on the edge at the very last minute that decide them. I got a call from somebody in Louisiana who heard one of these, these disgraceful Bush radio ads in which they say that, that Clinton and Gore are going to stop offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a, an outright lie, yeah. flat lie, comes out of nowhere. Mm. They're also <laughs> saying that they're going to steal the, uh, the, the tax benefits from farmers flat lie, you know, the, the Bush campaign is, is bottom dwelling. It really is. I think, I, I, I think the Chamber of Commerce in Arkansas ought to reward George Bush with a nice retirement plot <laughs> in Little Rock. And a rocking chair. Uh, right. Exit question. The exit question is we, we can count hours between now and the opening of the polls on mm. Tuesday. Is time on the side of George Bush or is the time available on the side of Bill Clinton? I ask you. The dumbest thing said here so far was Mort saying that Bush <laughs> peaked too soon. He's peaked at exactly the right oh, time. Yeah. Time is on you his side. You don't think he's peaking too late? No. Well, it might be too late, but think? it's not too soon. Not enough time for George Bush. Not enough time? No. What do you think? I, I doubt he has enough time either. I think it's a wash. So you think the time thing is a wash? No, I said I, he's peaked too soon. He's risen to his maximum level, and now people are going to focus... Time is on the side of Clinton. On Clinton. The time is on the side of Bush. Issue two, Pero Noya. Ross Perot sent shockwaves through the political landscape this week with spectacular charges of foul play. Recall that in July, Perot said he was quitting the race because it would throw the election into the House of Representatives. Now Perot says he quit because Republicans were planning a dirty tricks campaign against his daughter Carolyn. The GOP, he said, was going to release a doctored picture portraying her as a lesbian at the time of her wedding ceremony last summer. Perot also charges that Republicans were planning to tap the phones in his headquarters. Perot offered no proof of his charges. On Monday, furious over the media scrutiny of his accusations and what it had provoked, Perot stormed into a press conference and let loose. I'm not going to get into that with you because it's none of your business. I'm not going to... Look, I don't have to prove anything to you people. Now, look, look fellas, this is so... I'm not going to sit here... As with nine days or eight days to go or whatever it is and have you go Tweedledum and Tweedledee on this. I am sick and tired of you all questioning my integrity without a basis for it. The White House denies Perot's stories. And I think the, pres the uh, news media needs to take a look at this because they're the only ones left who can investigate it and, and prevent us from electing a paranoid person who has delusions. This man simply cannot see the truth. I agree that this... this uh recent incident is crazy. At week's end, Perot said he regrets raising the allegations and accepts the White House denial. He added that Bush was history and that he, Perot, would win all 50 states. Question. Uh, Perot's momentum is dropping fast. Is it because of his 60 Minutes performance and the subsequent events, do you think, Jack Jamon, what we're seeing here? 
Yeah, but a lot of people decide the guy's a nutcake. And they, uh, <laughs> Isn't it remarkable, and they, though, that, that the heavy money that he's spending on infomercials is not doing any good? Or does that make your point earlier that no, advertising uh, is dead? No, I don't think it's dead. I think he, was, he had a lot of very effective advertising. But when, he, when you go off, you know, I mean, the, like the radio ads, more was just talking about some other things. George Bush will do anything to win a campaign, and he'll run some pretty sleazy, venal advertising. But the point about this whole story about Ross Perot's daughter's wedding is it, what would that do for Bush? <laughs> Nothing. You know? So I don't think he'd do it because it wouldn't help. If it would help, I don't know. You know, you know what, what, what is the wedding? You don't think that'd be I a mean, big boost for the Bush campaign? Look, well, look in this case, uh, Ross Perot is a paranoid and, and all the other things that we think of him as, but it really is something. The way the press leapt all over this story to brand Perot a paranoid when the press is the ones that's pushing the October surprise, yeah. Iraq gate, yeah. Iran gate, yeah. and all these other uh, hey. conspiracies. Those those the, the, fact, the fact is that, that what the press was doing was they were worried that Perot was taking votes away from Clinton, so they oh, had to brand Lord. Clinton an idiot. That's, that's true. the best conspiracy I've heard yet. You know we don't operate like that. I mean, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> what a bet. Ross Kill the, Perot, the question of the kook factor has always been lurking around the Perot personality. Now it's out there. He had his temper tantrum on live television. If he had stuck to Larry King and paid TV, he might have been able to bring off this con. Exit. This what, what percentage will Perot get? Uh, Freddie. Eleven. Eleven. Eleanor. Twelve. Twelve. Jack. Nine. Nine. More. Ten. Ten. <laughs> Answer. Eight. <laughs> Issue three. Commander in chief. They criticize our country and say we are less than Germany and slightly better than Sri Lanka. My dog Millie knows more about foreign affairs than these two bozos. I believe that we ought to do better by the people who won the Cold War. Everybody knows the defense budget is going to be cut. The difference is how are we going to cut it and what are we going to do? Under my plan, we wouldn't have as many troops in Europe. As American voters enter the final stages of decision-making on whether to vote for Bush or Clinton, both candidates this week put foreign policy back on the table. The nation's headlines also call foreign policy to the attention of the electorate, publicizing several grave foreign policy danger zones, notably Russia. The government of Russia, President Boris Yeltsin, is holding together by a thread with Yeltsin barely able to stave off many would-be usurpers, especially the National Salvation Front. This week, Yeltsin ordered a 5,000-member armed guard controlled by his rival, the powerful chairman of the Russian parliament, to be disbanded. Besides political problems, Yeltsin faces a public and private sector laced with corruption. And the Russian economy is a basket case with inflation soaring at 1,300%. And more trouble. The massive former Soviet nuclear arsenal, 10,000 nuclear warheads, can potentially be put for, up for surreptitious sale. Nuclear materials and technology may already have been sold. All of these factors are part of an alarming picture of a former Soviet Union in a state of near anarchy, a condition that could, ri could invite another communist-like right-wing regime and another Cold War. Question. When voters enter the booth on Tuesday, will they choose their president with world crises such as these as part of their criteria for choice? Mort Kondracki. Of course. Uh, in, in part, they will decide on the basis of uh, foreign policy. It's, you know, it's an important factor, but it's not top on their list. And the, uh, you know, the Yeltsin uh, possibility, the, the fact that the Russian uh, government might collapse, uh, is back in the, in the, in the, uh, in the newspaper. It's not on the front pages. And, and in any way, you don't know that, that George Bush will deal as well with that crisis as he did with Desert Storm. I mean, the, it's way in the future. The, 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 you know, in the days when we had to worry about being nuked every day, and then the red phone ads worked. Foreign policy was a very important thing, particularly in the campaign. But I'm telling you, I've been traveling constantly in this campaign all year, and, and the, f the first person who mentions Yeltsin, the next person who mentions Yeltsin will be, will be the first. You know, it is off the screen. People are worried about other a, things. A measure of reader and viewer interest in foreign policy. Alger Hiss has lived under a cloud his entire life. He was cleared this week. The New, York oh, Times, he was New York Times put it on page B14. <laughs> Alger Hiss was not cleared, but you know, at all, that's one guy, some Soviet guy, saying well, something, it's nonsense. It's still a good reader piece at the very least. Read perjury. Read Alan Weinstein's it. book, Perjury, and you'll know I'll, Alger, I'll Alger Hiss is guilty. Files, Look, the fact is that one thing people worry about when they think about a commander-in-chief is private character. Democrats employed against John Tower when he was nominated for 
uh, a defense secretary in 1989, a test of if his private character and private life weren't exemplary, if he were not a role model, he was not qualified to be just, defense uh, secretary. Just a second, same Fred. thing. The same thing applies. Fred. Issue four, your term is up. Term limit fever is sweeping the nation. The goal, to limit the terms of U.S. representatives to six years in the House and U.S. senators to 12 years in the Senate. On election day, voters in 14 states will decide whether to impose these limits on their congressmen and senators. Question, is term limits a good idea and how many of the 14 states will pass it? Eleanor. They're a terrible idea, and they'll probably pass in all 14 states uh, because they are the vehicle for the same kind of voter anger that created Ross Perot. They're a terrible idea because the problem with Congress is not how long people have been there, but where they get their money and who they're beholden to. And a new set of freshman legislators every 12 years, that kind of turnout, turnover is a gift for lobbyists because freshmen come cheaper than the senior lawmakers. So Besides... Uh, the voters already have term limits. We're going to have a Congress with a third new faces. And, uh, you know, that happened the natural way. And voters are taking back power themselves. So you would vote if you were in the Congress against, or uh, you were voting, you would vote against term limits. Is if I right? were in the Congress? Well, uh, not if no. you were in the Congress. Would you would vote against term limits. <laughs> if I were in the Congress <laughs> voting, I'd probably vote for them because I'd be saving my skin, but with, I'm opposed the to The trouble with term limits is... I mean, I think these things are going to pass. The trouble with term limits is people have this idea that they're going to send Mr. Smith to Washington. He's going to be this wonderful guy. Jimmy Stewart's going to go to Washington and straighten everything all out, and then he's going to go back to the farm, you know. Baloney. What's going to happen is you're going to have two classes of people coming here, people who have businesses of their own that they can afford to leave for 12 years and go back to it in short, and more lawyers. It is said that long-term incumbents will take tough stands, okay? Right. Whereas newer congressmen and senators will not. I don't think so. Now, no, Ronald Reagan, no, no, no. Ronald Look, my Reagan. experience is that the younger members are more responsive to the voters right. than the older members. The older members become buddies with the lobbyists, become representatives of Washington back in their district rather than you know the other way around. Well, Fred, but Fred, you're not going to get younger people to do this. If you, sure you, you can't, no, you're not. Because yes, if you, you can't look forward to a career in politics, then you're going to look forward to a career in in business and you're going to at the age at the age when you would normally just would you be quiet a second <laughs> at the age when you would normally be be running for congress you would instead you will instead be going for vice president in charge of something besides that the constitution already provides for two years for a congressman and six years for a senator Excellent. you don't need a new oh, amendment You'd very have well stated words to live by from martin kondracki Prediction. Give me win, place, and show for the three presidential candidates who are alphabetically Bush, Clinton, Perot, with percentages for each, Freddie the Beatle Bonds. In a bigger upset than Harry Truman's in 1948, since Truman was never as far behind as George Bush was, Bush wins with 45%, Clinton 44%. Pro 11%. Excellent prediction. Eleanor. <laughs> Dream on. I spotted a new bumper sticker out there. It says, Annoy John McLaughlin. Elect Clinton. <laughs> uh, Clinton, 47. Uh, Bush, 41. And that's generous. He has not gone over 40 once during this campaign. Perot, 12. Jack. Clinton, 49. Bush, 42. And um, the other guy, 9. Seven points spread, Jack. Well, seven points is no big deal. That's what it was last time. More time. Eight point gap, John. 48 Clinton, 40 Bush, and 10 Perot. The answer is Bush 46, Clinton 45, Perot 8. Okay. What will be the result in the Electoral College with 270 needed to win? Freddie Bonds. Very, very narrow. Bush 277, Clinton 261. Excellent prediction. Threading the needle. Eleanor. Uh, landslide margins for Clinton. 388. He could even go possibly over 400. I, and that leaves Bush with 150. Perot, zero. Clinton's going to do well even in the Mountain West. Jack. Well, giving, giving Bush all the best of it and, and the closest things right now, I still can't get him near 270. I've got a Clinton with 27 states in D.C. for 325 electoral votes. 325. 
Mort. Uh, Clinton, 351, and uh, Bush, 187. Answer, Bush, 276, Clinton, 262. <laughs> Why do you take the position you're taking as to win place and show, Jack, particularly win in place? Because, of, because I look at the uh, poll, there are polls other than the CNN poll, which shows at one point. There are a lot of polls that show at seven or eight points, and I think that's what it is. So it's going to be the devil I know. It's not going to be the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know. It's going to be what Lola Falana says. Namely, if you're placed with a choice between two evils, you always pick the one you have not tried before. Next week, the big enchilada, election day, Tuesday, November the 5th, and Pat is back. Namely, Pat Buchanan. Bye-bye. <laughs> is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Public affairs programming continues on Iowa Public Television with this week's edition of Iowa Press. Tuesday's general election brings the Equal Rights Amendment back to the Iowa ballot. The stakes are high and the rhetoric is hot. We take a temperature reading from ERA opponent Phyllis Schlafly of the Eagle Forum and ERA supporter Eleanor Smeal of the Feminist Majority Foundation on today's edition of Iowa Press. But first, a big factor in any election is turnout, and turnout is affected by a lot of things. Appeal of the candidates, the intensity of the issues, even the weather. Let's get a different kind of a temperature reading now as we call for the insights of Mike Glover of the Associated Press and Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa. Kay, it feels to me like it's going to be a pretty big turnout this year. I have a real sense that people are paying attention to this election. The presidency is shaping up as a horse race now. We've got a couple of hot congressional races, and there's the ERA on the ballot. All of those are going to be driving turnout up. Ordinarily, I'd say big turnout helps Democrats. There are about 100,000 more of them. But this year, one major factor in that turnout will be Ross Perot voters. We just don't know where they're going to land. You're right. Perot supporters may go into the voting booth, vote for Perot, and go back out. Or they may stay in there and vote on other races. And I think they could provide the deciding votes in some very tight legislative contests this year. Well, I think one thing that's very clear, and that's that a big turnout is going to help the Equal Rights Amendment. It may pass because of that. Apathy has always been the ERA's enemy. For Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa, I'm Mike Glover of the AP. That's our insight. Major funding for this program has been provided by Friends of Iowa Public Television. With additional funding provided by the Daily Tribune of Ames. Owned by Iowans who love Iowa and believe in a free press and in Iowa's community newspapers. This is the Sunday, November 1st edition of Iowa Press. A discussion on the Iowa ERA Initiative with Eleanor Smeal and Phyllis Schlafly. Here is Dean Borg. Well, two days from now, America goes into the voting booth and Iowa steps into the national spotlight as the only state with the Equal Rights Amendment on the 1992 ballot. Pro and anti-ERA forces and money have been drawn to Iowa. And on this edition of Iowa Press, we discuss the opposing views of the ERA Initiative and we've invited two of the more prominent spokespersons for one final airing of that issue. ERA supporter Eleanor Smeal is the founder and president of the Feminist Majority Foundation and also a past president of the National Organization for Women. And also joining us in this edition of Iowa Press is anti-ERA activist Phyllis Schlafly, founder and president of the Eagle Forum and a longtime Republican delegate and committee woman. We welcome you both to Iowa Thank Press. You. Also joining us in Iowa Press, David Epson, the Des Moines Register, Mike Glover of the Associated Press, and Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa. Briefly, please, Eleanor Smeal, why should there be an ERA in Iowa? What's well, needed. Right now, this Constitution, which was written in 1857, says that all men are by nature free and equal. We're just adding the word woman, and then we're adding another sentence which essentially says neither the state nor its political subdivisions shall on the basis of gender deny equal rights under the law. Now, why is it needed? Women are discriminated against. We know what the pay situation is. Women make, you know, we say 71 cents on a dollar, but if you look at it by subsections, middle-aged women are making 54 cents on a dollar. Women who are older have twice the chance of being in poverty. 
Now, will it help? We know it will help because we have 16 states where there are ERAs in which we have experience. It has helped homemakers, it's helped uh, employed women, it's helped older women, and it even helps men. And we know there's only one problem. We have an opponent, an opposition, that lies about this amendment. That's about as brief as we could be. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, Mrs. Schlafly, why should there not be an ERA in Iowa? Well, our opposition to ERA is not based on a smear of our opponents, as their campaign is. Our opposition to it is based on the legal effects that we believe a state ERA will have. For example, when ERA was going through the Iowa legislature, some of the legislators tried to attach another sentence that said it will not have anything to do with abortion. They wouldn't allow that sentence in. And this clearly shows that they are and will use ERA to try to force the taxpayers of Iowa to pay for abortions. This is exactly what has happened in other states like Massachusetts and Connecticut where the, through courts, through ACLU lawsuits, they got the court to order tax funding of abortions. Mike, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, on the issue of abortions, you, your, your side makes in, in this argument the fact that the state's going to have to pay for abortions. Uh, what, what's the evidence that you use to cite that? What what cases, what well, states? the principal evidence is the Doe versus Maher case in Connecticut, where the court specifically held that the state ERA required them to pay tax funds for abortions. Yes, Connecticut right. tried to pass a law prohibiting uh, tax funds for abortions, and the state uh, of Connecticut court held that unconstitutional, specifically citing the ERA. Ms. Mill? Well, she's conveniently not talking about Pennsylvania or Hawaii or Massachusetts, by the way, which ruled that the Equal Rights Amendment did not apply to abortions. And she's citing a case in Connecticut, which she's citing only part of it, because Connecticut treats uh, uh, Medicaid funding. Now, remember, their literature is very... The reason why we're saying the word lie, we have to. It's not not saying anything against their opponents, but just saying what their statements are, is because they're half-truths, and more importantly, they distort. They say in their literature that this will pay for all abortions. What we're talking about is Medicaid funding abortions, and in this particular state of Connecticut, they said it was a right. In most other states, including Iowa, where it has been very explicit, it is a privilege, it will not cover. It is a bogus argument, and a bogus argument that covers up what their real intent is, to ban all abortions. But if okay, but here is the Connecticut case. It's this long, and it specifically says that the clause of the Constitution of the state of Connecticut, uh, it, uh, that the... Uh, it, that which prohibits abortion Medicaid funding is prohibited by the state ERA. It's so just they as were clear as it can state be. Medicaid rules. There's, that's that's right. right. But that's the, but what, it's the state ERA that requires tax funded abortions. And you're not mentioning Pennsylvania, and you're not mentioning Massachusetts. No, although you did, and although you said that, you don't pull out Massachusetts because it Massachusetts explicitly does says tax not, funded abortions. Yes, but not because of the Equal Rights oh, Amendment. And you know that no. they explicitly could, said it. Could, could, could I interrupt that a lot, David? The whole problem is it puts it up to the court to decide instead of the. Well, what's wrong with that? What's, What's wrong, wrong with that? With, that's the way because we settle disputes in our society, Ms. Schlafly. No, it isn't. Courts. A political decision, like whether the taxpayers are going to pay for abortions, is a political issue that should be decided by your legislature, not by your unelected court. But actually, the state legislature put this on the ballot. Remember, the state legislature of Iowa has passed it overwhelmingly twice. Both Republicans and Democratic <laughs> Democrats have passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Ms. Meal, why didn't the proponents of this measure agree to the abortion neutral language that she mentions. I mean, you have a process going along, people have some reservations, whether they're founded or not, uh, that, that this could lead to well, funding actually, of abortions. Now, you say it doesn't. Yes. If that's true, then why didn't you go along with their request for language uh, that would make the amendment abortion neutral? Because we were very explicit on the amendment, and, and we wanted to cover just sex discrimination. By the way, when we did modify the amendment, in, on the word gender, because they said, well, gender, in, in Vermont, they tortured us with a little ditty saying, because it, it said on the basis of sex, you couldn't discriminate or you must provide equality of rights. They then had a little ditty on, the, on their uh, television ad saying, it's not the sex you are, but the sex you do. And they said, why don't you say gender? So then we put gender in the Iowa one, and they're still bringing out the same old tired arguments because they don't 
have, they don't want us to discuss equal rights in employment. They don't want us to discuss equal rights in education. They don't really want us to talk about the money issues because they know they would lose on them. There isn't any legal difference between sex and gender. I don't know anybody who can tell me any legal difference. So that's, that's then the Then why do you make a big deal in your literature about the word gender? You do it right here. You say, see that gender? That's right. the hidden word. But it so, is. It but is. Why it's is not it on then? the ballot. And that's a very important point. And about Wait, half you the just ballots what you said. in but, Iowa but, do not can contain the words that are in the language, gender equality. But deal with the, the question here that she has raised, and that is the, the word gender. I can, I can tell you there's no legal difference between using then the word Then why do sex. you say that? Why do you circle the word gender and because say, why didn't they put the word sex I in? didn't say that. Oh, it says here, it says here that the words gender and equality will give the courts the power to implement, and you make That's a right. big deal out of it. I doesn't mention sex at all. It doesn't say anything about sex. But David, you have I'm, said it over and over I, again. I want to move on to a pay, the pay equity issue. Uh, Ms. Meal, how does this issue guarantee equal pay? I mean, we have laws on the books now that are supposed to do that. How will this, two-part question, how will this make any difference? And what will this mean to men? I'm really glad you asked it because, number one, it gives the constitutional standard, which is the highest standard. It gives more power to the employment discrimination laws, which if we are against sex discrimination, uh, in employment, we should give it the full force of the Constitution. It gives us a better chance in court to win. And secondly, it closes all the loopholes. And it not only strengthens the existing laws, it closes the loopholes in them. So it is much more comprehensive coverage. And how does it affect men? In employment, men should be grateful if there's more power to fight sex discrimination wages. Because if you have a cheap labor pool, eventually it pulls down all wages. If women's wages go up, it, le it threatens men's wages less, and in fact it is better for all workers. Iowa is uh, one of the 50 states. It is subject to the Federal Equal Pay Act, the Civil Rights Act. They have the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enforce the law against anybody who violates the law. And ERA does not add anything to that. It does appear that what Ms. Meal is wanting is comparable work, which is equal results, which is tossing it into the hands of some bureaucrat and saying, we want you to pay the women the same as the men, even though they are not doing the same work like they want the uh, secretary to be paid the same as the electrician or the prison guard. Now, this is a form of wage control to achieve equal results. And I don't think the voters understand that that's what they want. Uh, we believe in equal pay for equal work and equal well, employment. Wait, wait, that's true. Why doesn't that exist, Ms. Lafley? It if does. That's true, it why does doesn't exist. It, well, what's the 71 cents? Well, it's why, why, there's not only the, labor the 71 cents is an average of all women across the country. And the reason the, all women will never get the same pay as all men is because never? 25 years ago, talented, capable, educated women like myself devoted our lives to raising our children instead of to increasing our pay in the workforce. Wait and that is the reason. And people like me, who 25 years out of the workforce, are averaged into that 20, 71 cents. Well, first place, at all ages, and we've looked at it by gender, women make less. And not only do they make it at all ages, we've looked at it by occupation. If you compare a woman in a clerical job versus a man in a clerical job, or, or a woman in well, exactly the claims? same job. We, well, first place, we do file claims. One of the reasons you don't know how ineffective the laws are is you folks are always fighting not only the uh, in implementation of these laws, you oppose that every one of true. those laws. Oh, you oppose that is, them all. That is completely and untrue. And you, you don't try to enforce them. You don't try to implement them. It is us who take the cases to law, and we know that, that frankly, if you're for those laws, then just give them the power of the Constitution. Let's, get Let's move on to another They've subject. They've got the power of the federal government. No, I'm talking about the state constitution. Let's not mix up what we're saying. Mrs. Slafley, how would the ERA affect gay rights? Well, look at the language of it. The language says you can't uh, deny equality of rights on account of gender. Now, if a couple of men show up at the office of the city clerk and say, we want a marriage license, and she looks at him and says, you're both the same gender, I'm not giving it to you, she would have denied equality of rights. And I think you'd kind of have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to understand the political activism of the gay rights movement. They, they, they're filing suits all the time. They were filing for uh, same-sex marriage licenses in the District of Columbia this year. They're trying to be Boy Scout leaders. They're, they're trying to get their rights to uh, rent an apartment in a mom-and-pop flat. Uh, they are trying all sorts of things. And, and the basic argument against the ERA is that what it does is to move these decisions into the hands of the courts to decide. 
Does it affect gay rights? No, and she knows it doesn't. We have had equal rights amendments in 16 states, 12 of them almost exactly like this one in Iowa. They've been enforced. No state can she point to where it has legalized gay marriages or nor promote them. What they're doing is they're taking an issue and maligning a group of people who do not need, especially at this time in the AIDS epidemic, uh, more people bashing them. What they do need is more understanding. Mr. Shelfie, can you cite a, a case in uh, where it has affected the homosexuals in that state? Uh, they are using... No, I cannot because... it doesn't exist. It, no, because it... You look at the language of it. You can cite legal authorities. I was on the platform with one of the great uh, legal uh, constitutional lawyers of all time, uh, Senator Sam Irvin, when he said the only group of people the ERA will help is homosexuals. Uh, the chief, I went to law school uh, more recently after I was 50 years old. The principal law book used in the law schools on sex discrimination say that the effect in this area is not yet clear. When is it going to be clear after they get it on the well, board? Wait a minute. Mike. She says they, the only group that's affected is homosexuals. It's been say enforced. In, it, it, well, you said what Sam help. Irvin said. He's help. been dead for several years. But it hasn't helped them. It, they've been enforced since 1971 in the state of Pennsylvania, but many other states. And no state... And I can't cite one case, but I can show you where it's helped homemakers, where it's helped employed women, where it's helped older women fight discrimination. And so it's a bogus kind of argument. In 20 years, I'll tell family. you exactly. Mike, discrimination. Mrs. Laughlin, mm -hmm. has your attitude on gay rights changed since your son has publicly acknowledged he's a homosexual? No, it hasn't. Do you think that's relevant? I don't hate anybody. And, and what this was, was an attack on me, which shows the political collusion of the gay rights activists and the pro-abortionists to attack me because of my son, who lives a very private life. And the attack was launched in a homosexual paper in New York City. But what and, and, you know, you know, this is so irrelevant to what the ERA is going to do to the people of Iowa. No, I, I, I miss Shaffley, the point it's I'm It's very clear. I have no animus toward homosexuals. Mr. Shaffley, well, let him did. explain why he asked the question. The point being, I sense in what you're saying that there, there, that there is some disapproval of, of a lot of moves that have been launched towards gay rights. What I'm wondering, and you oppose those, what I'm wondering is, has your attitude on that changed because of a major personal occurrence in your life. No, my attitude has, is completely consistent. What I oppose is giving the homosexuals the special preferential rights that they are agitating for, such as affirmative action to get themselves designated as a minority like race or sex under the civil rights law. And you know, the Democratic Party platform specifically calls for that, and the Republican platform specifically opposes it. That is the kind of special preferential rights. Likewise, the same-sex marriage licenses. Those are the things I oppose. But I think the homosexuals should have all the constitutional rights of the rest of us, free speech, free religion, due process, and all the rest. Can, can, I, can I move on? David? I'd like to move on to another question. Well, uh, can I say one other thing about right. though? Because she keeps saying that they're not bashing the gay people, but their ads show them in a stereotypic and negative way. And not only that, I mean, I think the public should know they do link ERA and AIDS. This is an Alton, Illinois publication. I mean, essentially, they have lied about this issue at a time, and public should know about that. There's because... no lie in there. Oh, There's please. no lie in Neal, there. What about the, the issue she raised? Are, you try, is, are, are, are feminists and supporters just trying to attack her because of her son? No. In fact, we, I have known about her son for years. I have Can... not outed him, and I do think it's hypocritical for her to attack the National Organization for Women, which I was the president of, because we admit we have lesbian members as well as straight members, married members as well as single members. They won't admit Can... who they have in their, even in their own Can... family. So that's the, the Can reality. I... Can I move on? In the states that have the Equal Rights Amendment, the 16 states, how has it worked? What is it? What do you think it's meant in those states? You've mentioned the Connecticut right. and Pennsylvania cases, but how about the other states? And I want both of you, Miss Mill, you first. What has it meant in those states? I'm glad you asked. We did a total review uh, right this year because of the Iowa ERA uh, being on the ballot of what's happened in the other states, and I can tell you exactly. It has meant more athletic opportunities for women. Um, in several states, cases have been litigated, and the results are, and I do look at results, is that there's more interscholastic sports for women and there's more spending for them. It has meant in, for homemakers in divorce settlements that their non-monetary contribution, or what they do but they don't get paid for it, is valued equally, so it has raised 
settlements and child support. Uh, it has meant we have won uh, employment cases where a woman was laid off discriminatorily, and she and this is a recession, and she could fight that. So it's in specific specific areas of employment and education and, and divorce, it has been helpful. Mrs. Schlafly, what do you think it no, has meant in the uh, states? What it, well, it has meant there are now two states where they specifically have tax-funded abortions as a result of the ACLU lawsuit. Those are Massachusetts and Connecticut. Then we have the states that have unisex insurance. Maryland is another state with a state ERA. And just this year, they raised the life insurance rates on women simply to comply with this unisex mandate. There are other states where the ACLU is litigating all the time. You know, they put out the literature to their lawyers saying use state ERAs to stop parental consent laws for um, have minors having abortions. It's in their literature. We urge you to use the state ERA to do that. Now, there are not 16 states that have state ERAs. I can tell you, as an Illinois lawyer, we do not have it in Illinois. And our legislature rejected ERA every year for 10 years. What we have is the kind of language that I would recommend, which is the language of the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the laws. And we have a hundred years of, of uh, court decisions that show what that means. And it doesn't mean there's not a same-sex uh, uh, type of gender equality that the ERA would do. But if well, the 14th Amendment worked, why do women, so many women feel discriminated against? Well, uh, discriminated against? Yeah. Well, I believe in equal pay for equal work, but I don't believe in equal pay uh, for unequal work or equal results. Do you, and I, do you think there is sex discrimination in America today? I think there are some people who violate the law, any law you have. But I think we have remedies in place to deal with that. And I don't think that, uh, you know, we have laws against murder. Murders still take place. Do you think if we passed a constitutional amendment saying you can't murder, that that would solve the crime problem? I'll let's leave that question, let's, Kay. Let's talk about November 4th. Mm -hmm. What is the aftermath? Let's say Iowa passes a state ERA. What happens then across the nation? What happens in, in the nation is, is I think it gives encouragement. Is the only thing I say, think that they're saying is true to, uh, the, to more constitutional uh, amendments passing and eventually to a federal one passing. And, you know, basically, we keep hearing, I want to go back to something she's saying, like it will increase insurance rates. It won't increase insurance rates. And, in fact, right now the amendment is being used in several states to fight the discrimination in insurance that it taxes really women, older women especially. Let's take auto insurance, which they keep citing. Right. Women won't pay more in auto insurance. It will be on the basis of the miles you drive, not on your sex. And if it's on the basis of the miles you drive, women at all ages drive half as much Let's as men. Let's get the other side. Yeah, of course. course. What's the effect Let's in other states? What's the effect on... on on November 4th, what happens across the nation if the ERA passes? Well, I suppose that since they haven't won anywhere since 1977 and they've been defeated in state after state after state, I suppose that if it's uh, passed here, they it will encourage them to, to go for more. What happens if it's defeated? Uh, if it's defeated, I, I don't know what they're... You have to ask them what, what they're going to do. What will your group do if it's defeated? Well, we will rejoice if it's defeated because we think it will be a great plus for women. Oh, plus for women. Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Schlafly, one of the things that, that is pretty clear about this campaign, it has been a very hot one. Your side is, is running ads with very controversial images. Uh, the other side is running some ads with some controversial images. What does it say about this issue, and are the voters of this state rewarded by a campaign that's conducted like that? Well, I would like to point out that our, camp our ads do not make any personal attack but their ads are highly personally negative against me and I hope the Iowa voters are turned off with that type of smear tactic they have put out literature about me personally which is false ugly and negative we do not, not do we do not do that at all all of our literature is addressed specifically to the legal results of ERA that, you know that is, it's not true what she's saying there's no personal attack we have four ads one's a wage gap ad instantly we have no negative imagery that you're talking but about. You have an ad with a Ku Klux Klan. Klan. Yeah, Ku Klux Klan. Well, that's that a negative? reality. <laughs> that that is not about a reality. about discrimination. Sorry, what we're me. saying is in the past, people have fought discrimination. And we're saying that they, they have fought it in the basis of race and they have fought, you know, fought the, the, the correction of discrimination. What evidence do you have that race? anybody involved in the anti-ERA movement in this state is affiliated with the Klan? We didn't say they're affiliated with the well, Klan. Well, it's called guilt by association. Yeah, no. What evidence, so, Mrs. Shapley, what evidence do you have that uh, Mrs. Smeal and the people who share her views are affiliated with witchcraft or child killing? I didn't say that. 
Do you, do you really believe that's true? I didn't say it. You do you just believe associate it's true? yourself with it. I, I only defend what I write. And I think I, I present the legal that, arguments. Didn't Pat I think Robertson that's irrelevant. retract that statement? No, he didn't. He, what he said. Yes, he did. I thought he, he went on NBC on, and a national he, television he and did. said it was a mistake and he, he didn't mean to say he that. He did, but he's, he's not on the ballot. That. He is not on the he's ballot. The front what he says is basically irrelevant. And again, we need to address what the ERA is going to do. And what it is, is a blank check to the Iowa courts to make all these decisions, like tax funding, like gay rights, like insurance rates, all the rest. One issue that has come up in this campaign is the question of veterans' preference. Uh, Ms. Smeal, will passage of the ERA affect veterans at all? No. In fact, uh, it's even been litigated. It doesn't, and it doesn't. Incidentally, they don't say veterans' preference. Again, our opponents have deceived people. They say veterans' benefits will be taken down. And in fact, they won't. And no state have they been. And if they had, you would have heard about it. I mean, one of our troubles is they make an assertion, and it's hard to, to show that a negative doesn't exist. But it doesn't exist in any state. Well, let me point out that uh, what we did was to quote the uh, testimony of the president of the League of Women Voters, Dorothy Ridings, who testified that ERA would wipe out veterans' preference. Yes, she did testify. Now, it's a matter of opinion. We can't prove it one way or the it other. Hasn't. But But we can... We, they would they would try their cases if and they have indeed if you can't prove it, benefits, why are you, you using it in advertising because they'll litigate don't you know era is open season for the lawyers to go to court it and is. the aclu is revving up its lawyers and the now is revving, revving up its lawyers the fact and they want to decide these we, cases we, we have a minute courts. left who has a final it's question well i want to make sure the veterans preference is different than veterans benefits a lot of veterans probably watching this program wondering what's going to happen now, veterans' benefits, that's a federal matter, isn't it? And benefits are like awards for you've been wounded money right. things. Preference is a hiring thing, and it's a total different thing. And, she, and their literature talks about benefits, and no cases have been even litigated and isn't even challenged. And this is one testimony. Fact of the matter, veterans' preference was even litigated, and, and it was lost. It does not apply. Yes, not. But they keep trying. They, they keep trying. They don't keep trying. They that keep trying. Reality. And the case, the case, uh, the state where they litigated it was it in the state the before the passage of the state thing. ERA. Is my healthy to have a campaign? Campaign as dominated by the churches as this one is, Mr. Schlafly. Churches? Yes. Well, I, I think everybody's got a right to have an opinion about the, the issues, and Mr. even if you go to church, I think you have a right to. But the problem is, is that they're trying to tear down separation of church and state. The major opponent is the Christian coalition, tied to the religious right, in which the, the, even the campaign manager is tied to. Pat Robertson has been working with them since 1985. They're trying to legislate one way, which is a very narrow way, and to secretly take over politics here in Iowa. Look, we're not trying to legislate anything. We're just asking people to vote no on Amendment 1. They are the ones who are trying to change the Constitution. No, what your secret agenda is, is to take politics over so that you will eliminate uh, the separation of church and state. <laughs> oh, you will on. have tax-funded religion Let and uh, <laughs> religious schools. My agenda is that I have to close the program. <laughs> <laughs> and it's right here. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you, for uh, showing us what a real spirited discussion is. Thank you for being here. Well, this edition of Iowa Press completes our pre-election coverage, and when you join us next time, we'll begin our analysis of how you decided the issues. The chairman of Iowa's two major political parties will be joining us, Richard Schwarm of the Iowa Republican Party and John Rourke of the Democrats. will be here next Sunday at noon and at 7 Sunday night here on Iowa Public Television. And before we leave you, also a program reminder to pass along. Tomorrow, the senatorial campaign closes with a debate between incumbent Charles Grassley and challenger Jean Lloyd-Jones. That debate is sponsored by the Des Moines Chamber of Commerce, and it can be seen live here on Iowa Public Television. Live coverage beginning at 12.30 noon from the Hotel Savory in downtown Des Moines. And then we'll have a taped replay of that debate at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. And then at 10.30 tomorrow night, Iowa Public Television will present the alternative candidates in that 92 senatorial campaign. We hope that you'll be able to join us for one final look at the candidates seeking to represent Iowa in the U.S. Senate. And that's it for this edition of Iowa Press. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you next Sunday. Until then, I'm Dean Ford. Major funding for Iowa Press has been provided by Friends of Iowa Public Television. With additional funding provided by the Daily Tribune of Ames, owned by Iowans who love Iowa and believe in a free press and in Iowa's community...
You are viewing Iowa Public Television. Tonight, look at politics and life in Iowa. Meet those magnificent diving machines, the elephant seals, and see anonymous phone calls change some lives. The Iowa race for the Senate nears the finish line with the final strides run in a debate between Gene Lloyd-Jones and Charles Grassley. Iowa Public Television brings you live coverage of the debate sponsored by the Greater Des Moines Chamber of Commerce Federation. Watch the Senate Candidates Debate Monday live at 12.30 and again at 8 the same evening. Then at 10.30, watch the speeches delivered to the chamber audience by alternative party candidates in the Senate race, Alternative Views. This election day, Iowans need a station which has made an unsurpassed commitment to election coverage. A channel which has explored the issues and concerns of Iowa voters. On election night, choose the station that offers a balanced ticket. Election updates, commentary and analysis, and some special programming. Tuesday night, choose a resource for Iowa's future. Iowa Public Television.